Sarah, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ed. So I'll be looking at some of the experiences that we've been discussing this morning in terms of uh, the country experiences and the donor experiences and seeing whether we have policy guidance in some of these different areas and what kind of traction this guidance um, has currently. First of all, it, it does have traction in terms of the fact that it's built in within a political dialogue. And I think Alistair mentioned this morning uh, that the New Deal has been endorsed by over 40 uh, fragile states. And there's a lot of support uh, politically for this agreement from uh, donor agencies. Um, and this for a number of reasons. Of course, there's increased uh, focus from donor countries on, on fragile states. Uh, it's about 30% of ODA, not much, um, not much progress in terms of the MDGs, and not much progress either in terms of the traditional aid effectiveness agenda. For instance, if we look at use of country systems, it tends to be much lower, about 27%. Uh, we saw in the uh, Paris Declaration survey compared to other countries. In terms of um, project implementation units, for instance, we have about 11 uh, project implementation units for $100 million uh, in fragile states, where whether, it, whether, where, whether it is about, but sorry, it is about four uh, when we look at the entire um, countries that did the Paris Declaration survey. But apart from the fact that fragile states are important in terms of the donor focus. Sorry, just Sorry. to clarify, the, the mics are there for recording rather than oh, okay. amplifying. So they so don't, okay. Yeah. So I'll speak louder. <laughs> um, also in terms of the, uh, it's not just the fact that fragile states are important, of course, in terms of donor uh, funding, but also that uh, there's a recognition in the New Deal that we need a differentiated approach. So we can't just take whatever is happening in low-income countries, uh, even in, in the aid effectiveness agenda, and just transplant it back into uh, fragile states. It also means accepting uh, risks when engaging in fragile states, so we can't necessarily take the same fiduciary risk assessment models that we have in other states. Uh, and also focusing specifically on assessing and managing risks jointly. So rather than having specific uh, risk um, assessments doing this in a more uh, joint way and where possible using country systems. And also focusing on more innovative uh, aid instruments. Uh, the other issue which has come up a lot is, is the fact that we need to look at public financial management uh, and procurement in a more strategic fashion, and this is something that actually also comes in the report itself, um, in terms of uh, PFM as uh, bolstering the legitimacy of the state, and it's not just about strengthening uh, systems for donor fiduciary reasons, but also uh, in terms of linking it up with the broader political uh, settlement, which often is the case in fragile states. So apart from the importance, uh, what, what can we say that the guidance uh, has for us in terms of uh, state building and PFM, uh, then also capacity development, uh, risk management, and use of country systems? So I'll go through uh, those uh, um, one at a time. In terms of state building, and I think we have some copies at the back uh, in terms of the state building guidance, um, it tells us a number of things in terms of PFM. First, and this is not particularly a surprise to everyone, uh, PFM is not just a technical issue. Of course, it, uh, it is very political. And we need to take a political lens when we're looking at strengthening PFM. Uh, looking at the winners and losers, and I think uh, Mark mentioned the extractive institutions. So, so how do we look at those sorts of issues uh, when we're building uh, or strengthening PFM? And this has been said for a long time, but I think more work needs to be done in terms of the practical ways forward, in terms of taking uh, consideration the politics and opportunities for reform. For instance, are we going to go ahead with a, a very state-of-the-art integrated financial management system which uh, has recurrent costs uh, just before an election, for instance? What are the implications uh, for the new government uh, for, for such a system? The other issue in the state building guidance is that PFM is more than a sum of its part, a part so it's, we need to take a whole of government approach uh, to public financial management. So uh, donors shouldn't just be cherry picking um, from say the MTEF to the IFMIS uh, to, to other uh, reform aspects uh, because of the, otherwise they might not uh, be able to talk to each other and we've seen many cases where uh, the integrated financial management system isn't necess necessarily bringing out uh, useful reports that can be then linked to the medium-term expenditure framework. And also, as was mentioned in terms of pay, 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 uh, the idea of uh, civil linking it with civil service reform uh, is something very important. 
Also, when we talk about whole of government approach, we don't just mean in the government, but in terms of the donors as well, uh, especially in the case of fragile states uh, where we have uh, the uh, Ministry of Finance, uh, Foreign Affairs and the aid agency not necessarily always speaking the same language in terms of supporting uh, budget reform uh, and reforms in general because of different humanitarian and security imperatives. Um, the last point to, to make in terms of the state building guidance is the need to draw on local stakeholders to test the feasibility of approaches um, taken, such as organizing public debates to monitor uh, and to look at the public financial management. And I think this is what um, Andrew was speaking about earlier in terms of the policy space, the need to include uh, different stakeholders. Uh, and this is where, for instance, uh, undertaking uh, public expenditure tracking surveys where you do involve communities and you do involve, uh, where possible, uh, national statistics officers, for instance, in terms of uh, looking at monitoring uh, the public expenditure is, is very important in terms of building that policy space. In terms of the capacity building guidance that we have and, and which was um, also produced with, with CIPFA and the EC, it looks at the fact that, uh, and this is something that comes up in the report as well, there's more progress often in de jure reform than the de facto, uh, much more difficult in terms of the implementation um, of PFM reforms and also tends to be focused on central government agencies. Also, we have uh, many different policy guidance around the issue of no one-size-fits-all, which again is something uh, which we hear a lot. But in terms of practical suggestions, uh, twinning arrangements for, for, um, uh, for the development of best practice manuals is something that has been suggested, uh, and also joint learning studies as much as possible. And I think in the report as well, you do mention the idea of having uh, regional experts um, uh, come together to, to talk about the public financial management reform. Um, then in terms of the guidance on donor approaches to risk, um, as I mentioned before, there is a need to have a differentiated approach to risk. Uh, current ways of looking at risk are, are perhaps slow and inflexible, um, and uh, we do really need to look at how this uh, matches with pressure to, to uh, show impact and results, which currently a lot of donors are requesting at the, uh, at the same time. The other issue is mapping risks of engagement uh, with risks of not engagement. So what are the re reputational risks? What are the developmental risks of not engaging with uh, fragile states and the public financial management systems, including use of country systems? Also, the need for um, looking at donor systems and how to, how to encourage the staff uh, locally in donor agencies to take risks. Uh, often task team leaders uh, are not necessarily given the incentives within the institutions themselves to take risks um, in terms of use of country systems, for instance. And then finally, a more flexible view of risk within the donor countries themselves. We see some areas where we have task teams uh, in donor agencies uh, coming together with across the political spectrum to look at how to engage with a specific fragile state country and to perhaps even def define when in exceptional circumstances they can go beyond what the usual uh, donor agency would be, would be doing in terms of risk taking. Uh, and that's an approach that Denmark has taken and, and seems to be quite successful. Then, as I mentioned, the need to have shared concepts and frameworks for risk analysis. Uh, for the PFM diagnostics, we have PIFA, of course, which has uh, worked quite well in terms of uh, redu reducing the, the number of diagnostics. But the same needs to be undertaken now for uh, joint risk frameworks, so developing common risk analysis uh, as then a basis for harmonized approaches. Um, we also need to invest much more in uh, monitoring and evaluation, uh, including the capacity of staff uh, to undertake these, these sorts of monitoring issues uh, for, uh, for risks at country level. Finally, in terms of use of country systems, what does the guidance tell us? And we mentioned, I think there was quite a lot of discussion this morning uh, from the country perspectives on this. So if I was to take a glass half empty and, and be a little bit pessimistic, I would suggest that we haven't seen much progress in the use of country systems, and I think that was reflected in the discussion this morning. Uh, from 2007 till 2011, there hasn't been uh, all that much uh, increase in the use of country systems. And also, I think it was also mentioned uh, by Afghanistan, there isn't a correlation between the uh, use and the quality of country systems. 
Uh, if we look at the survey uh, of monitoring the Paris Declaration between 2007 and 2011, we look at those countries that have the highest score in terms of PFM. Uh, some uh, used country systems 20%, that was the case of Kosovo, and others 70%. So really there's a wide variation in terms of the use of country systems. Now if I'm trying to be a bit more optimistic, um, I would say that um, there is now amongst the donor community a much more nuanced perspective in terms of use of country systems. Um, it's not just an all or nothing approach, so there is a, an agreement to be more opportunistic uh, about the use of country systems. There is also an understanding of the need for better ownership or better taking into account country ownership in the decision to use country systems. For instance, in Kenya, uh, all funds should be approved by the parliament, but in Rwanda, only those that are managed by the government. So there are different perspectives as well from different countries in terms of uh, when and how you should be using country systems. And also something that I think um, was mentioned, the need for soft skills, so um, recognizing that use of country systems uh, it, at the field level requires a different type of donor staff. It's not just about knowing your own systems, it's about knowing the systems of uh, the country itself. And we've been quite astonished going into countries and facilitating dialogue on use of country systems when donor staff have been asking us to define or to help them understand better the system in the countries. Um, so these are some of the issues that we've seen time and time again. Um, on the positive side, though, as well, there is uh, political traction on this issue. It was one of the main sticking points at the Busan High Level Forum, and there, ha there is a strengthening now of the commitment on this issue. Uh, the G7 Plus and others continue to, to press uh, on this particular issue. Um, and at the country level, there is now an understanding that we need to develop more dialogue uh, and more coordination and harmonized approaches around the use of country systems, uh, including not only Ministry of Finance, but sector ministries and CSOs as well. Um, and it's something that the, the seven countries that have decided to be pilots of the New Deal, the compacts, are going to be looking at very carefully. And it's one way to take this back to the best fit approach, so not just uh, looking at how to blanket all or nothing use of country systems across countries, but really to look at which are the areas that the countries want to, uh, the donors to be focusing on. Finally, I'll just end with uh, two issues at the uh, international level which I think uh, have come up again uh, very often, and that is the importance of communicating the benefits of use of country systems to the donor parliaments, because when we talk about why is it that uh, countries are not using, uh, or donors are not using country systems even when uh, the PFM is, str is stronger, uh, clearly there are incentives um, internally for the donors uh, not to be using country systems, and if the public doesn't necessarily understand the importance of that, then we will continue to have headlines such as tyrants receive aid, uh, and, that all, and all that sort of stuff. Finally, uh, one important um, uh, point on knowledge sharing. I think we, we tend to have a discussion uh, between groups of countries, fragile states, middle-income countries, OECD countries around the strengths and weaknesses of public financial management systems. Um, but I think uh, there is a strong value in having a broader knowledge sharing network where practitioners, and practitioners from OECD countries as well as others can get together and talk about the challenges because uh, we find that actually in terms of issues such as performance-based budgeting, accrual accounting, and so forth, um, the OECD countries are, are very keen to talk about the issues that they face, actually, in, in building some of these systems. Uh, and often that knowledge is not translated into the discussions at country level, even in fragile states, where suddenly accrual accounting is, or budgeting is the best um, thing and the best option, when in fact OECD countries themselves are finding it difficult. So having that kind of knowledge exchange is very important and something that uh, we're trying to promote.